So hopefully you're finding your way, way back to the rest of us. It's good to see all of you this morning. All of you. It's always good. I sit down and then more of you show up and I look out and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Um, we're continuing our, our series in the Gospel of Luke this morning. As we get started, I was wondering, do you ever wonder what people say about you when you're not there? Uh, how do you, how do people describe? How do you think? and you picture? Did you ever wonder what the conversation looks like if somebody asked a friend or an acquaintance of yours um, something about you? What is what is so and so like? What are they what are they like? And then if you could be a fly in the wall and listen to what the answer was, how well do you think your friends, your acquaintances, your family members, how how would they describe you? Would they describe you well? Would they get you? Did they know you? Do you ever wonder how well people know you, the real you? Identity is a big issue. If you've been following the series, you know that identity keeps coming up. And mistaken identity leads to all kinds of problems in this world. Uh, when people, in between us, people not knowing who I am, Actually, for most of our lives, we are trying to figure out who we are. <laughs> so we don't even know who we are, let alone trying to help other people understand who we are. And people have all kinds of different expectations. Sometimes it's us, it's we who put forth certain things. Sometimes, though, people just look at us from afar and they make judgments. They decide who we are. Then they get closer and we either disappoint them or we surprise them. And they think we're better than they thought. <laughs> so identity is a thing. Uh, I heard a funny story last week. I was at a birthday party and um, at a friend's house, and, and they had a friend. So it's a friend of a friend, nobody, nobody that you know, some person from out of town. And she's a middle-aged single woman who was describing, she was real hilarious. She was a great lady. And she was talking about 
trying to do the whole dating scene online, you know, and how difficult that is. And it is, it is you hear stories about this, you know, how hard that is. And so she had done her homework and there was this one dude that she thought, I think he's my type. She looked at his picture and the description and all that, set up a date, went to meet him in person, goes to the restaurant, this guy comes in. And she's not a tall woman to begin with, and he comes in and he's like oh, this short. And she said his shoulders were like this wide. <laughs> and she's saying to herself, how did I get fooled? You know, like how did he, did he post a false picture? You know, he's nice enough, but not really her type. Finishes the date, goes home, goes back online. What did I see? And sure enough, she looks at his picture and he, he was smart. He, he learned from Connor's dad from last week about how to pose for a fish picture, you know? Basically, in the picture, he was sideways and he leaned in, <laughs> smiling. So she could, you couldn't tell his, he had a diminutive stature. Anyway, this is what we do, right? We put our best foot forward sometimes. Identity is a thing. Identity is a thing. And when it comes to Jesus, this issue of mistaken identity gets multiplied a thousandfold because of who he claims to be. Because of who he claims to be, the Son of God, the Savior, he's either that or not. And if he's not, then he's crazy or he's, he's wicked. Um, or, and if he is, then he is someone with whom we have to do. And so who Jesus is becomes of crucial importance, and that's the subject of our, of our uh, passage this morning. It's in Luke chapter 9, and this is a hinge, it's called a hinge chapter in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is now going to take a turn, and Jesus is going to take us deeper into who he is. This question of identity, as you, again, from the beginning, has is, is come up. We started our series with it, and here it comes again where the question is being asked, who is Jesus? So starting in verse 18, we're just going to walk through it and see where Jesus takes us. And what we're going to find is that not just for the world out there, but for people who claim to be Jesus' followers, we can get this wrong. Even for those who claim to be close disciples of Jesus, we can get it wrong. Verse 18, Luke 9. And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? So here's this identity question. But I want you to put a pin in the opening part here. It happened that while he was praying alone, prayer you're going to see is sprinkled throughout this. And in the Gospel of Luke, several times this identity question is linked to a time of prayer. We saw this when we opened the series. When we opened, the kids are having a great time back there. <laughs> um, when we opened the series, the... Uh, Jesus at his baptism, and this was an identity passage, it says he was praying. And as he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Spirit came down as a dove, and God the Father declares, this is my beloved Son, and him I am well pleased, identity. And in that baptism scene, as we saw, Jesus wasn't just being identified by the Father as the Son of God, Jesus himself was identifying in baptism with us with humanity. He was being the son of man and giving us our first hint, saying, I'm going to identify with you, not just in your humanity, but I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to identify with you in your sin. And it was a hint of what he's come to do. And then later, as we saw, he, he, he lets us know more. He says, I didn't come for the well, I came for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous, I came for sinners. Today, he's going to take it even deeper. So we have him in prayer. Keep that in mind. It's going to come up later. And he asked this question. Who do the crowd say that I am? And they, the disciples, answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others, that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And here again, we have a theme that keeps coming up in the Gospel of Luke. He asks first, who do the crowd say that I am? So remember, we've got four main characters in the gospel. The number one main character is Jesus himself, right? And that's the question Luke wants to answer, who is Jesus? But you have these three other main characters on the scene. You have disciples. They are those who say that they want to follow Jesus, follow him closely. They, they are for Jesus, and, 
and they're kind of being held up as this is what Jesus is looking for, right? He's trying to find disciples, people who will follow him. Then you have at the other extreme, the Pharisees, the religious leadership, the chief priests, the scribes, and these are sort of the anti-disciples. These are the ones who are opposed to Jesus. They deny his identity. They say he's a false prophet. They say he's a blasphemer. And in the end, of course, they, they want to kill him. And in the middle, you have the crowds. And the crowds, for the most part, are pro-Jesus. They also follow Jesus, but not in the same way that a disciple does. And Jesus, as we saw, is trying to call disciples out of the crowds. And the crowds are fickle. And in the end, they side with the Pharisees, crying, crucify him, crucify him. These ones who followed him around for three years. So the crowds are this funny, ambiguous bunch in the middle. So he asks, who do they say that I am? And at this point, they say, nice things. Some think you're Elijah. Some think you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some think you're one of the prophets of old. They identify Jesus with their Old Testament heroes or with these current people that they think highly of. So the crowds are pro-Jesus. They have a high view of Jesus. The problem is it's not high enough. Just thinking well of Jesus is not enough. It doesn't make it accurate. This is the problem in the world. In the world, if I think if you took a poll of the whole world, you'd have your Pharisees, you'd have those who reject Jesus outright, who, who see him negatively. But a great majority of the world actually has a very high view of Jesus. He's a great moral teacher. He tells us to love our neighbor. He's a good dude. <laughs> and they would say that. But it's inadequate. It's not high enough. That's the crowds. So he goes on and he says, turns to his disciples and he says, but who do you say that I am? And this is where it gets interesting. Peter answered and said, the Messiah of God, the Christ of God, the anointed one. Verse 21, but he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone. Why? Jesus would not make a good evangelical. <laughs> He's always... You know, we'd be out running around, you know, we tell people, get out and tell everybody immediately. He says, don't tell anybody this. Why does Jesus say this? Isn't this the good news? The Jewish Messiah has come? Go tell everybody? As we're going to see, this is a case where having the right title, which Peter gives the right Sunday school answer, is still not good enough. Having the right title isn't good if you have the wrong idea attached to that title. Let me give you an illustration of what that means. When Lashawn and I were missionaries in Ireland, we went over to the Republic of Ireland, predominantly Roman Catholic country, with a minority of, of Protestants living there. And we went to work with college students who were like getting disillusioned with everything religious. But as they're normal people over there, people, here come these Americans, they ask identity questions. They want to know, who are you? Just like this, who are you? And they want to get you in a category. And the two main categories in Ireland are, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant? That's what they want to know. Those are the two big categories. And so they would find a way to kind of ask you that, but you were sort of stuck when they asked you that. Obviously we were Catholics, okay, so we couldn't say that. The problem is, while sitting here and theologically, technically, I'm a Protestant. To say to an Irish Catholic, I'm a Protestant, is not a good idea. <laughs> what they think in their mind when you say I'm a Protestant is not what you and I would think. It comes freighted with all the social and political baggage. It means you're anti-Republic of Ireland. It means you're pro-British. It means you're pro-Empire, the British Empire. You're with the bad guys. It means all these things, and if I said I'm a Protestant, I would be misleading them about who I actually am. They would think things about me that were not true. It's the same problem with this title, Messiah. To a first century Jew, the idea of Messiah comes freighted with all kinds of political um, ideas, military. This is our deliverer, the one who's gonna put the Romans under the boot and raise Israel to being the nation of nations in the world, reestablish the kingdom and rule. 
And so to say he's the Messiah would be to mislead. How do I know this? Well, as the story unfolds, you can, you can tell. Um, he goes on. Well, yeah, he goes on and says this. Verse 22. He says, tell this to no one, saying, so he continues, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So he goes on, and this is what's crucial about this passage, is that Jesus is now going to tell us what kind of Messiah he is. And it doesn't fit what they expected and what they were looking for. Matthew's account flushes this out really well. <laughs> it's almost, it's comic. Matthew's account has Jesus asking the same question, and Peter gives, you know, he's the star student. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, well done, you get an A. He goes, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Good job. Go to the front of the class, you know. And then he goes on and says, and I, the Messiah, the Son of Man, am going to suffer, be rejected, be beaten, and killed. And then Peter, it says he grabs Jesus, he literally grabs him and rebukes Jesus and says, this will never happen. To which Jesus turns around and rebukes Peter back and says those famous words, get behind me, Satan. He goes from being the A student to detention. <laughs> Typical Peter. And so Peter's right with the title, but he doesn't understand Part of the, what the Gospel of Luke is teaching us is discipleship is a process. These are disciples. They get it, but they don't get it. And they're slowly getting it. And this is the beginning of Jesus opening their eyes to see the kind of Messiah that he is. Now, there are two reasons that Jesus has to get this through their heads. And they don't really fully get it until after he rises from the dead. But there's two reasons why we need to understand this. First of all, in telling him this, that the Son of Man is going, to be, is going to suffer, he's now explaining to them how Dr. Jesus is going to bring healing to the world. He already said, I didn't come for the, the, the well, but for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous, but sinners. He already said he came to cure this disease of sin, but he hasn't explained how. Well, it turns out, that he's not a doctor that comes bringing a vaccine or a pill or some regimen of physical therapy. He's saying now, I am the cure. I'm the one who's going to bring the cure. I'm going to take the disease of sin and I'm going to take it into myself. I am going to suffer the consequences of your sin so that you don't have to. This is how I'm going to heal you. Not by giving you a third party remedy, but by being the remedy myself, and it is going to be my death. So that's reason number one they need to know it is they need to, this affects their relationship with him, and it affects our relationship with him, our understanding of who he is as the Messiah. But the second is very, very, very important. It's really the point of this passage, and that is this a disciple's identity is determined by the identity of his master. A disciple's identity is determined by the identity of his master. Now, we've been saying this for a few weeks, that there's this mirroring going on, that this question of identity is both a question of who is Jesus, but it also forces us to ask a question of who we are. And in the one case, it's, he's the doctor? Well, then, am I sick or am I not? I need to make a determination. If I say I'm not sick, well, then Jesus didn't come for me. And I can just pass along. But if I admit I'm sick, then that's why he came. But I have to admit I'm sick. It's an identity thing. He's going on, though, to say, but I'm going to heal you, and I'm going to change you. He goes on and he says, verse 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. He doesn't stop with, Yes, I'm the Messiah, and here's how I'm going to save the world. I need to go suffer and die. He follows that up with, and by the way, it says that he was saying to them all, he, he widens it beyond the 12, 
He could be talking to the 70, but he could be talking to the crowds at this point. And he says, I'm going to suffer and die. I told them that privately, but now he, he opens it wide and he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And this plays into Connor's definition of what he gave us last week of what a disciple is. A disciple, Connor told us, is not somebody who is a student who comes in to a classroom, sits down, and has the instructor teach them a bunch of knowledge, walks away with the knowledge, comes back, takes a test, gets an A. Like, like Peter saying, Messiah, good, A+. Plus. That's not what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who follows in the footsteps of a master. Getting to know, not just, they are taught by them, they are taught by them, but they're also watching them, learning who they are, their values, their ways, so that they can imitate that master. And that's why a disciple's identity is determined by the identity of their master. Who the master is, is who I am becoming. And so Jesus says, if you're going to come after me, you've got to do the same thing that I'm about to do. You see, the crowd follows Jesus too, but they just follow him around at a distance. Disciples follow near, and they follow in his footsteps. The crowd comes for what they can get from Jesus. The healings, the food, the bread. Disciples come for Jesus himself, because they want to be like him. Jesus asks all of us, who do you say that I am? And he wants you to give more than just a title. He wants to hear, how would you describe him? Do you know him? Are you coming to know him? Because seeing who Jesus is, not only who he really is, not only affects the relationship that we have with him, just like with each other. If I have a mistaken understanding of who you are, it's going to affect the kind of relationship I have with you. So it affects that relationship. But because you're a disciple, it also affects who you are becoming. Because he's not just like one of us. We don't look at each other and say, well, I, I want to know you so I can be just like you. <laughs> no. We look to Jesus and say, I want to be like him. Well, what you think of him then matters. You're going to become like what you think he is. If he's Lord alone, if you think of him as Lord, that's true. Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord and Master who's going to, you know, he's like the sheriff. He's going to ride into town one day and clean up this town, punish those pagans, and, you know, sort things out. If that's how you see him, then you'll probably tend to be, you know, wanting to police the world in the name of Jesus. Jesus is saying you need to see me, first and foremost, as the suffering servant. He goes on in verse 24, For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whatever, whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. This is that paradoxical statement often quoted, if you save your life, you lose it. If you lose your life, you save it. What does he mean? What is he talking about? Well, I, I actually read a great, I, I, we'll look at it kind of in the big, and then I'm going to give you an example in my own life. In the very big, there is so much truth packed into this, even secular people get it. I read this article. I don't know if this person's a, a believer or not. She was writing in this sort of philosophical journal. The journal itself was not Christian. But she wrote an essay called The Cult of Life, When the Drive to Life Becomes Deadly. I think about that title. The Cult of Life. She means that negatively. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I don't think coffee helps. <laughs> um, when the drive to life becomes deadly, when the pursuit of life becomes deadly, sounds like what Jesus is getting at. He who seeks his life will lose it. Here's what she says. She points out how in contemporary society, the increase of comfort and the possibility of satisfaction and security have led to a devaluation of life expressed in what she calls a cult of life as an end in itself. Basically, what she's saying is that in the West, because, you know, in other times and places throughout history, pretty much most of humanity lived in misery, okay? And they just hoped to scrape by. But because we have so much comfort 
and we have so much, it's easy for us to believe that the ultimate satisfaction of life is just around the corner. If I just, you know, buy one more toy or make a little more money or just get a little more control in my life, I will be happy. And because of that, it creates this pursuit of that life that she says uh, ends in death. Here's what she says. In this kind of outlook, comfort, security, pleasure, and the pursuit of our unhappiness are exalted to the point of becoming guiding ethical values, activities that we must frantically engage in. People recognize without hesitation earthly life as the goal of all aspiration and action. And then I'll read this last part here. This really gets to the punch. She goes, when the cult of life expressed through the gratification of needs takes precedence over spiritual values, then well-being, power, security, peace, and order become the guiding principles of existence. Principles that are rooted in natural instinct rather than spiritual ones. Now, I know this is heady stuff, but what she's saying is that when we buy into this cult of life, as she calls it, then these aren't bad things. Listen to the list again. Well-being, power, she means control, control over your life, security, peace and order become the guiding principles. She says, but that's just rooted in your natural instincts. Of course you want those things. There's nothing wrong with them. But she goes on to say that if that's all you shoot for, it, uh, society starts to fragment, and people actually become less happy, not more. It doesn't work. She doesn't give an answer, but Jesus does. Jesus says, you need to flip this on its head. Instead of making that your big goal of life to get your own well-being, power, security, peace, and order, you need to give up your life for the sake of others so that they can experience those things ultimately in Him. That's the big idea. Let me illustrate it with just a very simple example in my own life. Now, I'm purposely going pretty mundane, pretty simple, because I think that's captured in when Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. We think, take up the cross, and we think, Golgotha, right? The epic, sacrificial moment. Well, you may have those moments a few times in your life, or maybe once, I think you could only you know, die once, but... He says, take up your cross daily, because I think what he's getting at there is that for most of us, for probably all of us, our life is the sum total of innumerable small choices we make daily that add up to a life either lived sacrificially or not. And it's in the small choices that our lives are made. And if we're waiting for the epic moment, it either never will come, or if we're not making the little choices, that when the big choice needs to be made, we'll find that it's not in us to make it, because we haven't been doing it all along. So in my, in my life, one, and I can give you a million examples, okay? I just thought of one that I think a lot of you, those of you who have been parents, would, would uh, identify with, but that's not the point. It just illustrates this choice, and that is raising kids. Now, when my kids were little, and we didn't have smartphones, but we did have, you know, the television and uh, Disney videos, <laughs> and then came the personal computer with video games, and then, of course, educational programs. What a joke. Um, which, and, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not panning those things in and of themselves, okay? Love Disney videos, video games are fun. That's not the point. The point is that as a parent, those things make wonderful babysitters, okay? They are wonderful. And I just have to say and confess that throughout my parenting years, um, there are too many times where I crossed over that line and made that choice to extend the, the screen time or find a way to extend the screen time. Not because I really cared about the good of my kid, because I, but because I just wanted a little peace in my life. I, it was for my well-being, my peace, my order. Because when everybody's either asleep in my house or staring at a screen, there is peace on earth and goodwill <laughs> towards men. 
But it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut. And I know, and I knew in those moments, though I didn't always face it, I knew in those moments when, when the reason I was finding a way to grant them more time wasn't really for their good, it was just for me. Because I like my peace, and I like to go do what I want to do, go read my book, or do my thing. And the hard thing in those moments would have been to maybe engage my kids in some activity, or play a game, or go outside with them, or, 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 or just let them be miserable <laughs> and bored. Because then, and, and put up with that, because I don't like that. <laughs> not pleasant for me. I'm a guy who just likes everyone to be happy all the time. When people aren't happy, I want to fix it real quick. And those screens fix it real quick. But maybe suffer through that so that my kids could learn how to get over that, how to engage the world in a different way. Now notice in this example that two things happen that are destructive. One is my discipleship and the second is theirs because I'm discipling them as my children. Obviously for me, it's this choice to put my well-being, my sense of peace, my thing first, and I'll do what I can to placate everybody else so that I can do what I want. That's not what Jesus called me to. He called me to do the harder thing, to be a dad, to be a dad, which requires little sacrifices all day. Secondly, what am I teaching them? I'm not teaching them the very skills that they're going to need to be able to be that kind of self-sacrificing person later. I'm teaching them, no, get your satisfaction immediately. Get what you want now, instead of how to wait or how to not have. This is, these are things they'll need when they try to live out what it means to sacrifice what they want for the sake of another. And so it's a vicious cycle that just perpetuates. Hope that illustrates, again, I could, I could, it's, it's in these little mundane choices that life is made and what Jesus is calling us to take up our cross and to love and serve the people around us. Now, in closing this out, and this gives us an end for it, kind of sends us out as to what to do. We have this second story that I'm not going to go into great detail on, but it's married to this story. So that right after this, uh, we have the story of the transfiguration. Jesus taken these uh, the three of the disciples up a mountain. In verse 28 it says, Some eight days after these sayings, Luke is linking what just happened with this event. Eight days later, he takes Peter, James, and John. They went up onto a mountain to pray. Ah, prayer again. Gee, I wonder if there's going to be an identity thing about that. But I wonder if Jesus is about to reveal something to them. While he was praying, the appearance of his face became different. His clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared, appearing in glory, were speaking of Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They're talking about the fulfillment of his mission and talking about his death. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. This is a great metaphor for everything that's going on here and in the whole gospel and in our lives. They're sleepy, they're half asleep, their, eyes, their lids are half closed, they don't see. That's us. And when they wake up, open their eyes, the transfiguration here isn't so much Jesus changing as their view of Jesus being transfigured. They're seeing a side of Jesus they've never seen before. They see his glory. And as, as they were leaving, Moses and Elijah, Peter says to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then Luke says, Peter did not know what he was saying. <laughs> I think that's so funny. It's a nice way of saying, Peter didn't. Peter was babbling. <laughs> he didn't know what he was talking about. And it's funny because Jesus and the Father just completely ignore him. You know, they just pass right by this comment. Peter's just, but I, most people think Peter's saying he doesn't want the moment to end. This is this cool moment, seeing Jesus' glory. He's like, hey, can we build a shelter and keep, keep him here for a bit? He gets ignored. While he was saying this, a cloud forms, and it says, begin to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And this, in the Bible, when a cloud comes up, usually in this kind of context, it's the presence of God. So they get enveloped in the presence of God, and a voice comes out of the cloud, sounds a whole lot like the baptism scene, saying... 
This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. It ends as it, began, as it began, Jesus alone in prayer. And then the last word of the epilogue is, and they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. In Matthew's gospel, on the way down the mountain, Jesus commands them, just like here, don't tell anybody about this. They don't tell the story until after, until all the pieces have been put together and everybody understands that he came to suffer. Because if they ran out and said, guess what we just saw? Glory Jesus, shiny Jesus. <laughs> Their fellow Jews would say, let's march on Jerusalem and let's kick out the Romans. They wouldn't have understood. Where does that leave us as we go out? This thing about prayer. This whole episode is enveloped in prayer. Prayer at the beginning, prayer in the middle, ends with Jesus alone. Um, we don't see Jesus. We don't get his identity except through being with him in prayer. What I don't want you to walk out of here thinking is this. This is not the message this morning. Jesus came to die. He lived a sacrificial life. So should you. And then you go, yeah, I don't do that very well. Okay, so I'll go out and I'll try harder. That is not what you should do with this. Jesus is that uh, Isaiah 53 servant, suffering servant. It says in Isaiah 53, Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, you know, that he carried our infirmities, our sickness, and on him was the chastisement that made us whole. By his stripes we are healed. What, you should, what we should do is look at this, rightly say, okay, Jesus, first of all, came to die for me. Yes, he's called me into discipleship to do the same. And yes, you should sit there. If you're out there and you say to yourself, eh, I, I'm pretty good at this. I love people pretty well. I, I'm good. But I come to learn more about Jesus and do kind of churchy things. Well, that's the crowd. That's crowd thinking. <laughs> I'm fine. But I like Jesus. That would not be a good place to be. <laughs> that's the way the crowd thinks. If instead you look at yourself and you go, I don't do this very well. I don't make these sacrifices that I should to love and serve others so that they can see Jesus through me and be drawn to him for salvation. I don't do that very well. If you have that thought, that's probably a true thought. <laughs> and you should probably have that thought. But the next step is what's really important. Rather than just go out and try harder, instead, what we ought to do is fix our eyes on Jesus. And, and he asks you the question, who do you say that I am? When you look at me, who do you see? I hope who you see is who he just revealed. A savior hanging on a cross, dying for you. You standing in front of him and saying, Jesus, I don't do what you did. I don't do it very well. I fail at it every day. He looks down on you from that cross and he says, I know. That's why I came. That's why I did this. You don't love very well. And that's why I gave my life. That's why I sacrificed myself to not only forgive you of your failure to love very well every day, but to transform you so that you can. It's only with our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the one. That is the gospel. That it's only through him and his sacrifice that we can become like the master and be that same kind of person. We don't die for the sins of the world, but through our service and sacrifice and love for others, others see Jesus. In our little decisions, and yes, sometimes in the big things that we do, they see him, and they're drawn to him. And through him, they have life. So fix your eyes on Jesus. But 
Who do you say that he is? I hope you see a crucified Lord. Because that's who he came to be, to reveal. And that's the kind of disciple he's seeking to make. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your great love for us. And Jesus, we thank you that you became a man, walked among us, identified with us, not just in our humanity and our weakness, but in our sinfulness. That you took on our identity so that we could take on yours. That you took on our sins so that we could be made well. And so Jesus, we will know nothing among us except you and you crucified, as Paul said. We see you as the suffering servant who died but who was raised again in glory. Thank you for dying for us, Jesus. Thank you for our forgiveness. We who have been forgiven much, Lord, we want to love much. Thank you for changing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we'll uh, sing our doxology. Be dismissed. Sunday. And then have a good day tomorrow. Hopefully you're all yeah, going to enjoy Labor Day. Amen.